Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Charlotte Congregational Church. A special welcome and thank you to Carl Rakia and Jane Kittredge and Ben Lively, parts of Skylark, for being here with us this morning. Um, uh, before we get into the service itself, I know that Peg has a little announcement that you would like to make, so come on up. Um, good morning. Welcome. I'm going to speak to you a little bit about Lund Family Home. But first, which is a home for um, mothers with young children that don't have a home, unwed mothers, a whole long list of history um, in Burlington for these children. And um, so first of all, I'm going to ask you to just come into your heart and remember. Remember your first day at kindergarten, your first day at third grade, your first day at seventh grade. And what about your freshman in high school? Can you imagine walking in there with no book bag, no nothing to write with, and maybe shoes with a hole in them? So one of the projects that we do here at, uh, at our church is a book bag gathering. We bought 50 of these, and we're going to be stuffing after church with um, all the goodies that anyone can imagine that they would need for a first grade of any of those classes. And in, in your pews and in the back, there are little envelopes to help us pay for that. And there's a mark on it that says Lund. Just circle that if you are making a donation that way. And I thought about those, um, Susan and Betsy and I did the shopping and Roger, and we looked around and looked around. And there's kindergarten, and you know, what do you put in them and stuff like that. Come on, kindergarten. <laughs> So the kindergartners got a little thing to look in to help with their fear. So thank you, and um, please open your wallets. Thank you, Peg. Um, so obviously, 
Kevin is on vacation and Hadley is on vacation, so I am so glad to be here with you this morning. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about next week's service. We're going to have a prayer song and witness service. This We've had them in the past, but not um, since COVID, I don't think. And this is a time when I invite you to think of a time throughout this week when you have felt God's presence in your life, or perhaps when you have longed for God's presence and not found it, heard nothing but silence. What did that feel like? And we will invite people from the congregation to come up and share briefly that kind of witness. If you feel so inclined, that would be wonderful. And I don't choose the hymns next week. You all choose the hymns. And Cameron has put together a list of 50 hymns that will be included in the bulletin of ones that you can choose from. So when it comes time to sing hymns, it becomes uh, raise your hand and we'll sing the hymn you love. So I invite you next week to that prayer song and witness service. And this morning... Um, I don't know how to say this. I guess yesterday morning early, I received a telephone call from Robert Fleming from Malika House, who was due to be with us this morning, hence the African theme and the scripture, all focused around children in Malika House. And Robert is not well. He's quite ill and unable to be with us. So I ask that we pray for his healing and recovery. He's heartbroken. Um, we talked quite a lot this week about what he would say. Not so much about what Malika House does, but the why. Why does he feel this calling? Why do the people who serve Malika House just are so indebted to it and so in love with this service? So we will get that at some point, but in the meantime, we pray for Robert's healing. So remember... <laughs> No matter where you are on your spiritual journeys, no matter what you believe or what you question, where you've been, what you've done, who you love, what you look like, what you wear, what you have, what you lack, here with us, may you let that go and simply find safety and a sanctuary for your soul. So this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So, um, Kimberly, would you come forward? We've been lighting this peace candle for 18 months or more now, and we light it to remind ourselves that the peace in the world begins with us as well, that while we pray for peace across the globe, and particularly, of course, in Ukraine, we know that it begins with each individual heart. And so we stand with the Prince of Peace as we sing together, Moved by Love.
And now I would invite you to stand as we join together in our prayer of confession and the Lord's Prayer, printed both in your bulletins and on the screens. This prayer of confession comes from Nadia Boltz Weber. As we say together, I say no when I should say yes. I say yes when I should say no. I stumble into holy moments, not realizing where I am until they are over. I love poorly, then accidentally say the right thing at the right moment without even realizing it, then forget what matters, then show tenderness when it's needed, and then turn around and think of myself way too often. And so we pray together, our God who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us, save us in the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Even before you said, I confess, your transgressions were forgiven. Even before you acted, you are embraced in love. So let's join together as we prepare for communion with hymn number 311, Let Us Break Bread Together. Please be seated.
So dear friends, this isn't my table, and it's not your table. It's Christ's table. And because it's Christ's table, we are all welcome here. Every single one of you, you are welcome to come just as you are. You don't have to believe what I believe or what the person sitting next to you believes or what your parents believed or taught you. You don't have to worship in a certain way with a certain person. You just have to come exactly as you are, loved and be loved by God. So come as you may, not because you must, and here find spiritual healing for your journey. So let us pray. Holy God, our loving creator, close to us is breathing and distant as the farthest star. We thank you for all that you have made. We thank you for all that sustains life and for people in all generations who have given themselves to your will, and especially for Jesus Christ, whom you sent from your own being as our Savior. We praise you for Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection, and for the calling forth of your people throughout the world. And we commit ourselves as we come to this table to prayerful, compassionate, and courageous action in the world. So come, Holy Spirit, come, bless this bread, and bless the fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking at this table that our eyes may be opened and we might recognize the risen Christ in each other, in our midst, in the gift of creation. Amen. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples saying, take, eat, this is my bread. This, the stuff of creation, these grains, this salt, this water, this is my body for you. And so as we gather, we remember also that after supper, Jesus took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to the disciples and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And as you come together, um, a few notes. The communion bread is gluten-free to be inclusive as possible. Also, the uh, cup is juice. And you, we, what we do with the bread is we hold the bread until everyone has been served, and then we partake together to symbolize our communal worship. And then with the chalice, with the cups, you can drink that as soon as you get it uh, to symbolize your own personal journey. So the gifts of God for the people of God.
the bread of peace. The cup of blessing poured for you. Let us pray this prayer of thanksgiving from Iona. Gracious and merciful God, you have fed us at your table. May the nourishment we have received enable us to enrich the lives of others wherever we go from here, whether the future be dark or bright, the road be smooth or rough. 
whether our cares be light or heavy, our song strong or weak, keep our hearts warm and our hands open, our lives embracing and ever embraced by your love. Amen. So the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. And now I would invite the children and youth um, to go to Sunday school. So this is the time when we raise our prayers to God, prayers for healing, prayers for petition, prayers of joy. Are there people for whom you would like special prayers this morning? All prayed up. Yes, Dan. So prayers of thanksgiving that uh, Lucy turned 21 yesterday and is now traveling home uh, from Hawaii after the summer away. So prayers for Lucy. Yes, Len. Len's friend Beth, who is dealing wisely and bravely with a terminal illness. Yes, Trina. So, um, yes, I do raise before you uh, David Brown, who is here with us, and for the Berger family, Ann Brown died on Tuesday at Respite House. So we hold the Brown family and the Berger family in our prayers. Anyone else? I would ask for prayers for Krista Reinecke's brother, Bill Duffy, who was uh, diagnosed with leukemia a couple of months ago. And for Linda Reynolds, continued prayers for healing and hope and peace and strength. Anyone else? So let us pray. Dear God, much of our country is sweltering. People are faint from heat, fearful of the future, as are we all. But close to home in our little world, we are grateful for this sunny day and a break in the rain. Remind us as we gripe about a wet, hot summer how verdant our land is. Ours is not a land of cracked earth, parched and dying people and animals. Make humble our hearts when some lament busy lives while others are alone and spend their days staring and waiting. Paint smiles upon our faces that we might celebrate the joy of small things, of blueberries and marigolds, of conquering beans and yard-long zucchinis, of new notebooks and pencils, of baseball and cooling rivers and inviting lake, of cookouts and creamies and kayaks and friends. Remind us, O oh God, that you feed our souls through the gifts of this creation, that you sit with us in our darkest nights, nourish our roots and cause our hearts to blossom. When we are firmly anchored in you, no wind can crack our trunk, no drought dry our spirits, no flood drown our hope. So thank you, God, for the gift of your son, Jesus, who made real the beauty of this life, your presence in calamity, and the ever-renewing power of love. Amen.
Good morning. Our first scripture is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 13 and 14. Then the children were being brought to him in order that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples spoke sternly to those who brought them, but Jesus said, Let the children come to me, and do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. And then from Psalm 91, you who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For God will deliver you from the snare of the hunter and from the deadly pestilence. God will cover you with pinions and under God's wings you will find refuge whose faithfulness is a shield and a defense. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. For God will command angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. May God bless this reading to our hearing and to our understanding. So let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In the 1950s, there was a radio program called This I Believe that was hosted by the acclaimed journalist Edward R. Morrow. Each day, some 39 million Americans listened to essays from people like Eleanor Roosevelt, Jackie Robinson, Helen Keller, Harry Truman, as well as corporate leaders and cab drivers and cooks and scientists and secretaries. Anyone who was able to distill into a few minutes the guiding principles by which they lived their lives. Their words brought comfort an inspiration to a country worried about the Cold War, McCarthyism, and racial division. National Public Radio resurrected the program in 2006, calling it again, This I Believe, Jay Allison and Dan Gediman were the producers. It ran for four years. I listened to the broadcast weekly, curious about uh, what others would say, happily disregarding the elephant in the room. Finally, I could do so no longer and realized this is my job. I ought to be able to say what I believe. I'm a walker. It's when I do my best thinking and praying and meditating and I admit planning, planning the day, the week, my children's lives, upcoming conversations, 
if you walk a question long enough, some clarity is bound to be revealed. Most sermons I come up with are born, nurtured, and crafted on the road beneath my feet. When I challenged myself to figure out what I actually believe, many, many miles were traveled. I did finally submit an entry that was selected and broadcast and actually later put into a book of the same title. I'll read you that offering in a moment. It's not an easy thing to do to summarize what you believe clearly and succinctly. Yet when people join our church, we have the chutzpah to ask them this exercise in the new member classes. What do you believe, we ask them. It's not a test of their faith or of them, but rather an opportunity to get a feeling for what the church through history has wrestled with in crafting everything from papal encyclicals and creeds to mission statements, like our church. Archimedes famously said, give me a lever and a place to stand and I can move the world, thus expressing both the power of leverage and the need to plant oneself firmly someplace, at least temporarily. As I pondered the question, it was helpful for me to narrow my focus and lay characters on the screen to take hold of a lever and wonder how my beliefs move not the world, but my own actions. Here is what I wrote in 2007. It still feels pretty true to me today. Like most women of her generation, my grandmother, whom I called Noni, was an excellent seamstress. Born in 1879 in Galveston, Texas, she made most of her own clothes. Widowed at 43 and forced to count every single penny, she sewed her three daughters' clothes and some of their children's as well. I can knit, but I cannot sew new creations from tissue paper patterns. Whenever I try, I break out in a sweat and I tear the paper. It clearly requires more patience, more math, more exactitude than I seem willing or capable of giving. Recently, though, I have come to relish the moments when I sit down and somewhat clumsily repair a torn shirt, hem a skirt, patch a pair of jeans, and I realize I believe in mending. The solace and comfort I feel when I pick up my needle and thread clearly exceeds the mere rescue of a piece of clothing. It is a time to stop, a time to quit running around trying to make figurative ends meet. It's a chance to sew actual rips together. I can't stop the war. I can't reverse global warming. I can't solve the problems of my community or the world, but I can mend things at hand. I can darn a pair of socks. Accomplishing small tasks, in this case, saving something that might otherwise have been thrown away is satisfying and perhaps even inspiring. But mending something is different from fixing it. Fixing it suggests that the evidence of the problem will disappear. I see mending as a preservation of history and a proclamation of hope. When we mend broken relationships, we recognize that we're better together than apart and perhaps even stronger for the rip and the repair. When Noni was 78, living alone in a small apartment in New Jersey, a man smashed the window of her apartment where she lay sleeping and raped her. It was so horrific, as any rape is, that even in our pretty open, highly verbal family, no one mentioned it. I didn't learn about it for almost five years. 
What I did notice, though, was that Noni stopped sewing new clothes. All she did was mend anything that she could get her hands on, as though she could somehow soothe the wound, piece back together her broken heart, soul, and body by making sure that nothing appeared unraveled or undone as she had been. Mending doesn't say this never happened. It says instead, as I believe the Christian cross does, something or someone was surely broken here. But with God's grace, this person will rise to new life. So too my pajamas, the fence around the garden, the friendship torn by misunderstanding, a country ripped apart by economic and social inequity, and a global divide of enormous proportions. They all need mending. I'm starting with the pajamas. So yesterday, when Robert called to tell me how flattened he was, this morning's service was effectively flattened as well, in effect, broken and in need of mending. How good, I thought, that we will share communion and recall Jesus' words, this is my body broken for you. And so we are all mended and resurrected, not cured, but healing, often in unexpected and surprising ways by the grace of God grace, and peace. And so as we give thanks for the grace of God, as our worship moves towards its end, but our service begins, we give thanks for the many ways that you all support the Charlotte Congregational church support the ministries that all of you go out in the world to do all the mending you do here at hand and far afield we do not pass the plates but there are plates at both doors of the sanctuary you may of course give online there's a qr code in your bulletin so thank you for your generosity and your commitment to mending in the world
So please rise as you, in body or spirit, as you are able, as we sing together hymn 374, Won't You Let Me Be Your Servant. So go forth from this place, and may you have the strength to let others mend you. Amen. Mm -hmm. 